Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to this course on history of international politics. I will immediately share my screen and to permit you to know exactly what we will be talking about. History of international politics is the title of our lectures, World Orders in International History is now, the subtitle we will come back, of course, to the to the meaning of world order and world orders. Uh, the syllabus. Here's the syllabus, and uh, you see that after today's introduction, the lectures will be divided into uh, two parts. The first part will deal with the international system, the historical evolution of the international system. Second part will deal with the historical development of an international society, and we will uh, conclude with a kind of uh, a forecast, kind of a prediction of uh, what the future world order might consist in, extrapolating, of course, the contemporary trends uh, into uh, the future. We'll start today logically with. Um, the introductory chapter, history of history and uh, international politics. I will uh, make some preliminary remarks uh, upon my conception of history of international politics, of course, and the combination between the two. And then I will very quickly sum up the different, uh, put forward the, the major assumptions first and then sum up uh, the major points that we will see throughout uh, the different chapters that you saw on the syllabus during, I repeat, the next 12 weeks. Introduction. Let's start with the introduction. History of and history and international politics. Academically speaking, first major remark. Academically speaking, this uh, course belongs to the discipline of international relations and not uh, to the discipline of history. Uh, I'm a political scientist, more specifically an international relations uh, teacher or researcher in France. International relations is not an independent discipline, it's part of political science. Anyway, I specialized in international relations, in international relations theories, more specific. But I will, of course, use history. So I will combine the empirical uh, material provided by history and the theoretical frameworks provided by the discipline of international relations in order to do what? In order to analyze the evolution of international politics roughly from the beginning of modern times uh, five centuries ago up to now to better understand uh, the contemporary world order we are living in. To put it differently, I will try to propose tentative answers. I uh, emphasize tentative. There are no, and I hope there will never be, definitive answers in social sciences and therefore in international relations. I will try to propose um, tentative answers to questions such as where does the contemporary world order come from? Which processes, which events, which tendencies which uh, turning points did contribute to shape it, to make uh, out of the contemporary order what precisely it consists in. And in order to do so, I will use theoretical frameworks taken from mainstream IR theories, that is to say, realism, uh, liberalism, the various uh, versions of these two major approaches, plus a little bit of constructivism, I uh, specify immediately soft or social constructivism, there will be no uh, post-positivist elements in, in my uh, analysis. We can put it differently, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, am adherent of what was called when I was a student, the classical or traditional approach to international relations, as opposed to the then behavioral approach or modernist approach. And um, nowadays, maybe we could say the qualitative as opposed to the quantitative 
approach to uh, international relations in France, the fact to combine history and theory uh, characterized, I would say, the most important, the best IR theorist in France, that is to say, Ramon, in his piece and war published almost exactly 60 years ago in 1962, the French original, this is the American translation, and the fact to combine in a fairly pluralistic, eclectical, maybe synthetical manner, realism plus liberalism plus constructivism characterizes the so-called English school of international relations. I will come back, of course, uh, to this English school. So I will care about history of international relations and of international politics. I will come back in a few minutes to this uh, somehow important difference. So why should we care about history of international politics? You know the answer, and I alluded to it, in order to better understand the contemporary world stage. We cannot, I think, understand the world we are living in if we do not know its historical roots. This uh, point seems self-evident, ladies and gentlemen, and yet, and yet, when we look at the discipline of international relations, and we look at the way it is practiced by the majority of scholars, at least in the Western world, that is to say, first and foremost, in American universities, what do we see? We see that the historical background of contemporary affairs and almost so the historical depths is almost completely neglected, if not ignored. The proof of this has been provided by a research project, the so-called TRIP project, teaching and research in international policy, teaching research and international policy, a research project undertaken at the William and Mary College in Williamsburg, Virginia, for some 15 years now, regularly updated. So what do these researchers do? They undertake surveys, having a look at how the discipline works in the US and then in Canada and then Western Europe, in English speaking countries, in the rest of the world, which paradigms are prevailing, which are the best journals or the best universities, departments of international relations, which uh, publishers are considered to be uh, the most prestigious ones, uh, do uh, a scholars uh, uh, propose practice oriented or not uh, publications, how many female scholars are there, is there uh, importance rising or not, etc, etc. And they also looked at, of course, uh, what the different publications in the major journals consisted. And they found out that in the 10 uh, supposedly best journals of the discipline, almost exclusively American plus British and uh, European ones, of course. Uh, it's a Western discipline, I'll come back to this. Um, they found out that um, in 2007, when the first uh, survey was published, it has been regularly updated ever since then, they found out that the majority of articles, 70% of the topics dealt with in the articles of the major journals uh, started with or were interested in events that took place after the end of the Cold War. That, and what's more, some 50% dealt with post 9 11 events, which amounts to saying that the historical the roots of these events is almost completely neglected. I think this is um, a mistake, or at least I do not share this uh, conception of what research in international relations should consist in. One example or two. Let's start with the first example. You know the expression post Cold War world. This is the term used to designate the world for some 30 years now since the end of the Cold War. There is no positive concept to define the contemporary world order. It is called the post Cold War order. And then there is a second uh, term, expression referring to the Cold War, the expression new Cold War. It was used some years ago by uh, Russian uh, politicians or experts or pundits anyway. Uh, they designated the, the, 
the relationship between Putin's Russia and Obama's America as a new Cold War. And this expression also has been used uh, two or three years ago uh, to designate Trump's relation uh, with China. Now, ladies and gentlemen, new Cold War. Can we understand what the new Cold War should consist in, if it exists? If we do not know what the old, the genuine, the original Cold War consisted in, of course not. Can we understand the post Cold War world if we do not know what the Cold War world was consisting in? Of course not. The Cold War, ladies and gentlemen, you know that was the period from 45 and 47 to uh, 89 or 91, the rivalry, the political, military, economic, ideological, power political rivalry opposing the US to the USSR. You know that. But of course, what is all the more so interesting is that the US and the USSR had been allied during World War II in their fight against notably Nazi Germany. So how can we understand that after having been allies, the US and the USSR ended up be becoming opponents, rivals, if not enemies? To understand this, we have to go further back in history, maybe to 1917, when the former Tsarist Russia became the Bolshevik Soviet Union after the revolution in 1917, the October Revolution, so-called October Revolution. Revolution put an end, established a socialist or communist or totalitarian regime in the USSR, perceived to be threatening by the US and the Western world. Now, the Bolshevik Revolution had put an end to the uh, Tsarist regime. The Tsarist regime had been a major power uh, throughout the 19th century, during World War I, at least, before being defeated, and then all the more so during the 19th century, it contributed to the defeat of Napoleon, uh, wars fought against uh, Russia by the British and by the French to support the Ottoman Empire during the so-called Crimean War in Central Asia. The British Empire and the Russian Empire met in Central Asia in contemporary Afghanistan in the territory which roughly corresponds to the contemporary Afghanistan. So we cannot understand the so-called new Cold War, the so-called post-Cold War world if we do not know, if we do not go back, sorry, to past uh, decades and centuries. I mentioned Afghanistan. What did Joe Biden say one week ago when withdrawing from Afghanistan after 20 years of uh, American presence, of presence of American troops, unable to defeat uh, the Taliban. We will withdraw, focus now on uh, re-emerging Russia and emerging China. We will no longer proceed to nation building, etc., etc. And the media, of course, beyond their criticisms against the way uh, Joe Biden and America organized their withdrawal. Anyway, it's not important in our perspective here. Some media, the New York Times, for instance, published articles upon the so-called, uh, upon Afghanistan as the so-called graveyard of empires. Afghanistan is supposed to be the graveyard of empires. America was defeated, or at least was unable to defeat its opponents, the Taliban. The Soviet Union, ladies and gentlemen, when I was a student in the 1980s, was unable to defeat the Mujahideen, that is to say the Islamic fighters. There were no Taliban yet. They managed to become powerful in the 90s after the withdrawal of the Red Army. So the Red Army occupied Afghanistan from 79 to 89 before Gorbachev decided to withdraw the Red Army, aware that uh, the Red Army would be unable to control the country. And 100 years earlier, at the end of the 19th century, the so-called great game that I mentioned between the Russians and uh, the British in Central Asia, both the British and the Russians tried to control this Central Asian territory, which now corresponds to Afghanistan, and they both failed. And this is the reason why the reputation 
of Afghanistan as the graveyard of empires has been existing for more than 120 years now. Friedrich Engels uh, had even written a, uh, a short article, in, I think it was in a newspaper at the very end of his life, in the, in the end of the 1880s, emphasizing the fact that Afghan tribes of whatever ideological obedience would never submit to any kind of foreign occupier, be it the British, the Russians, the Soviets, or nowadays the Americans. Once again, history is absolutely indispensable to explain, to contribute, to understand what is happening nowadays. Last example, China. China is rising and rising and rising. And as such, of course, it is likely uh, to threaten the existing order, or it is perceived to threaten the existing order. So what do Western powers and Western media and Western governments and Western NGOs do? They criticize. China's uh, violations, or what they consider to be violations of, of basic human rights of various populations, ethnic or religious minorities in China, and of course, in Hong Kong. The national security law that was adopted in Hong Kong uh, in June 2020, as far as I remember, but that was imposed, of course, by Beijing. To some extent, then, Western powers do interfere in Chinese affairs, telling the Chinese government what to do when dealing with, telling them to respect human rights. What does the Chinese government's reaction consist in? Of course, it consists in saying that these affairs are Chinese domestic affairs and foreign powers, the US, uh, the European Union, France, Germany, etc., or NGOs should not interfere with the so-called non-interference principle which is uh, emphasized in the UN chart. Beyond the political dimension, of course, of uh, the attitude of the Western powers and the attitude and the reaction of the Chinese government, what I want to emphasize is that maybe, maybe, the Chinese refusal, the rejection of any interference can be explained by the perception of China regarding Hong Kong, notably, the perception of China, of Hong Kong, as a former colonial British territory, conquered by the British thanks to the war that they fought in the 19th century, the Opium Wars, the Boxer War. During the 19th century, that is to say, during the century of humiliation, this is the Chinese perspective, when the Chinese Empire was declining and when the major European powers plus the US plus Russia, practice so-called gunboat diplomacy, forcing China and also Japan to open its doors to Western missionaries and to, West, to Western merchants. China was forced to sign unequal treaties. And of course, nowadays, China no longer accepts this and therefore refuses what it considers, rightly or wrongly, ladies and gentlemen, as a Western interference. I emphasize rightly or wrongly, in order uh, to make sure that there is no misunderstanding. Let there be no misunderstanding, please. Of course, I do understand that the Hong Kong population cherishes its political freedom, which is directly linked to the British presence during roughly one century. But I, as a scholar, try to understand why this uh, feeling is not shared by the Chinese government. So my aim here, this is a general remark as a teacher, as a, as a university a professor, is just to contribute to understand how things occur, that is to say, to identify and to describe them and to try to understand or to explain them. This, ladies and gentlemen, should be, this is my conception, of my job, this should be the role of a university teacher, not tell uh, the students what he or she appreciates or what he or she uh, does not agree with. His job should not consist, or his or her job should not consist in giving advice, 
to uh, governments, to authorities, or to multinational firms, or to NGOs. This is what experts are doing, or consultants. No, teachers, professors should transmit knowledge to their students in order to permit these students to make up their own opinion rigorously, thanks to the theoretical frameworks, frameworks thanks to the major concepts in the discipline, and in our case, in the discipline concerned, in our case, in international British. So, history, ladies and gentlemen, the fact to go back to history should permit to overcome one major weakness, what I do consider, together with other scholars, of course, as one of the major weaknesses of international relations as a discipline, what Barry Buzan and Richard Little call chronocentrism or presentism, that is to say, the discipline of international relations is tempted nowadays to focus merely on present, current affairs, forgetting the historical origins, the historical roots of these current affairs. This presentism, this chronocentrism, the fact to focus on contemporary events and processes does not characterize IR merely, but all the social sciences due to the fact that more and more social sciences from sciences tend to become expertise, that is to say, problem solving knowledge. I try uh, to resist this trend, I disagree with it, and therefore I do consider history to be important. History, ladies and gentlemen, and to go back to the title, um, history of world history, world history at least partly. Why world history? In order uh, to avoid another weakness also emphasized by uh, Buzan at Little, um, what we may call and what they call Eurocentrism or Western centrism, the Western biased and the Western centric perspective of the contemporary discipline of international relations. To come back to the survey of uh, the teaching, uh, re teaching research and international policy projects of uh, the University of uh, the William and Mary College in Virginia. Come back to the survey in the major journals, 50% of the articles deal with topics directly concerning the US. 25% deal with topics concerning regarding the rest of North America and Western Europe. And only the remaining quarter, less than 25% of articles published in the major journals of the discipline of international relations deal with the rest of the world. So Western centrism. This Western centrism, ladies and gentlemen, is, can be explained. First of all, it is due to the fact that International relations is a Western discipline. It was created, it emerged in the United Kingdom in 1919, the discipline of the first department of international relations, strictly defined, was created at the University of, uh, University of Wales in, uh, at Aberystwyth, United Kingdom, and it is in the US after World War II that it became a somehow, I would say, credible discipline taught in all the major universities in the world. So it is an American social science to uh, quote Stanley Hoffman, his article in the 1970s, I are an American social science. It's the first reason why Western centrism is prevailing in the discipline. The second reason is even more general. It is, ladies and gentlemen, somehow inevitable not to be ethnocentric. We all look at the world through our looking glasses. That is to say, our world vision is shaped by the context in which we grew, in which we go on living in. We cannot but be Western-centric as living in Western countries for 60 years now, as far as I'm concerned. 
third argument to focus on Western uh, issues or on issues and processes and topics dealing with Western states or with Western societies is somehow understandable if we know, and I come closer to the topic itself, to the, the basic assumption of my course. The fact you focus on a Western, to, to have a Western-centric perspective can be understood by the fact that for some sen five centuries now, the world is dominated by major Western power. If you accept that political science and therefore international relations, first and foremost, is the study of power and domination. And since this power and domination was exerted by Western, first European, nowadays American, states, then it is somehow logical to have such a Western-centric perspective. But, but there is a flaw. There is a negative consequence of this somehow understandable trend to be Western-centric. This is what uh, Edward Said calls Orientalism. This is the French translation of his Orientalism that goes back to the 1970s. What is Orientalism, ladies and gentlemen? It is the fact for Westerners to look at the rest of the world, not merely at the East, first at the East, but we can go beyond uh, the Orient, the East. It is the fact for Westerners to approach the non-Western world, not as it is somehow objectively, or not as it is subjectively or intersubjectively perceived by the populations living in the rest of the world. No, it is the fact to perceive the rest of the world as we would like it to be, as we would like it to be. Thus denying the rest of the world any kind of agency. It is not an actor of history. It is an object. And this, of course, is a flaw limit the negative consequence of Western centrism that should be avoided in an academic setting. A very short example, a very quick example. For some few centuries now, American administrations, more or less explicitly since Clinton, used the term rogue states or rogue regimes or rogue actors when designating some autocratic regimes or terrorist networks that do behave violently and or that do not respect basic human rights regarding their own population. However, the term rogue states or rogue regimes is not a neutral a scientific concept. It is a stigmatizing term. The so-called rogue actors themselves do not consider themselves to be rogue actors, just as terrorists most of the time do not consider themselves to be terrorists. This does not mean that they are wrong or right. This means that we should be aware of the nature of the terms and concepts that we use. That is to say, regarding Western centrism, we should be eager to maintain, to keep our Western centrism under control. This would already be a significant step forward. At least I hope I will be able to do so. So what will I concretely do in this class in order not to be a victim of a too biased Western-centric perspective? I will integrate world history in my analysis, not by referring to non-Western-centric approaches in IR. I do not really know whether there are such non-Western-centric Nowadays, approaches in IR. In the history of the discipline, the only, I would say, somehow credible, serious, non strictly speaking, Western centric or non Northern centric approach that was able uh, to be acknowledged as credible, as serious, was the Latin American Dependencia, a school in the 1960s, 70s, maybe 80s. All the other approaches do come from North 
or northern countries or north or western or northwestern America and the English speaking world in general and the European continent. So I will not take into account non-Western centric perspectives. I will not either uh, consider non-Western units to be uh, uh, likely in the past. I do not consider them to have been rivals, competitors, serious competitors of European powers. This is the claim put forward by the British Jason Sharman in his Empires of the Weak. He considers that, as the title indicates, he considers that um, the European states' powers were actually weak when they met with uh, overseas empires, be it the Chinese Empire, be it India, be it even the Aztecs uh, or the Incas in, in Latin America, uh, the Islamic empires, etc., etc. And it is only in the 19th century that Europe ended up definitely uh, dominating the world. I would not go as far as saying that. I would say that ever since uh, the end of the 15th century, European powers overcame their non-European prospective rivals, though they did not systematically conquer them within short time period. So I will not consider these non-Western powers to be important in the past. My uh, integration of world history in my analysis will consist in trying to put myself in the mind of non-Western actors when analyzing the relations of domination and conquest that the Western powers had with these non-Western entities. That is to say, I will focus on the history of the great powers. And I agree here with Kenneth Waltz in his theory of international politics. To quote Kenneth Waltz, page 72, the theory, like the story, of international politics is written in terms of the great powers of an era. So I will focus on great powers and they happen to be Europeans or Western, European and nowadays North America. And therefore I will focus on these powers. However, I will consider the relations of these European powers plus the US, the relations with non-European entities as important I will consider them to be instrumental in the European powers world political domination. The interactions, ladies and gentlemen, third preliminary remark that I will focus on between Western powers, among Western powers and between Western powers and non-Western entities. These relations, these interactions, I will have a look at, are exclusively the political, diplomatic, strategic, military relation. You may know that international relations as a discipline because of the huge domain potentially concerned by very vague expression international relations. You may know that de facto this discipline is divided into two major subfields, international security. On the one hand, international political economy, on the other hand. Nowadays, it is impossible for one single researcher to deal with all international issues. So what do scholars do? They either focus on international security, that is to say, war and peace, conflict and cooperation, order and disorder, stability and instability, or they focus on international political economy. That is to say, economic, commercial, cultural, environmental issues, migrations, global commons, climate change, global governance, etc., etc. I think a choice must be done 
and the one I did then understood this, is favorable to the classical conception of international relations as international politics, what realists call the high politics as opposed to low politics. I will focus on political relations in the domain of war and peace, conflict, and cooperation, order and disorder, stability and instability. To focus on international politics uh, traditionally or strictly defined does not imply, ladies and gentlemen, this is an, uh, an error pretty often committed, does not imply a realist approach. And pretty often he or she who uh, is interested in the topic peace and war indeed is a realist scholar. But realists are not the only. I ask scholars interested in war and peace. So are uh, liberals. There are liberal theories of war and peace, peace through interdependence, uh, and therefore war because of protectionism, uh, peace through international institutions, uh, peace thanks to democratic regimes, and therefore war because of autocratic regimes, etc. etc. So liberals also propose a theories of war and peace or of conflict and cooperation. And so do constructivists, at least soft constructivists. Alexander Wendt, of course. Alexander Wendt, social theory of international politics, social theory of international politics to be distinguished from theory of international politics. So the aim of Wendt was to um, criticize Kenneth uh, um, Waltz, and therefore his title, Social Theory of International Politics, directly refers to Waltz's theory of international politics, my theory as Alexander Wendt. The social theory, I will show that anarchy does not imply a state of war. There are different types of anarchies, etc. And he's interested in international politics strictly defined, that is to say, in violence and the regulation of violence, what we could call war and peace, of course. So my theoretical approach is not strictly speaking, exclusively realist. What then will my theoretical background consist in? Well, the response to this question, ladies and gentlemen, can be found in the title of, uh, yeah, subtitle of my lectures, World Orders in History. What is an order, ladies and gentlemen? I will give you a neutral, a descriptive, as opposed to normative or critical definition, an order, <clears throat> sorry, an order is an established arrangement of among units of a group. I repeat, <clears throat> an order is an established arrangement among units of a group. In our case, a world order is an established arrangement among political units, states and or non-state actors at the world political stage. And if you accept this uh, definition and if you apply it to international politics, this arrangement has two dimensions. It has two dimensions, a material one and a non-material one. The material one refers to what the English school, and this then is my background, calls international systems. The English school, and more specifically, one of the founding fathers, Hadley Bull, in his Anarchical Society, published in 1977 or 79, in the end of the 70s. An international system, an international order, a world order, first consists in an international system, the material dimension. But the international order or world order also has a non-material dimension. And this non-material dimension is called international society by Henley Bull. International system is a term used by realists, but realists would not never use international society. So you immediately see that the English school goes beyond a mere realist approach and integrates 
liberal elements, liberal in the, the philosophical uh, meaning of the term, I would say Lockean elements or Grotian elements as the philosophy of Hugo Grotius, the philosophy of uh, John Locke, as opposed to Thomas Hobbes' political philosophy, which, which is at the root of, of the realist approach. So the English school then is basically uh, the school which inspires my analysis here. So let's have a look at the meaning of international system and at the meaning of international society. In his 1977 published Anarchical Society, Hadley Bull gives us the following definition of an international system. An international system, first he says, is a set of states, we could say political units, independent from one another. So a terrorist network, ladies and gentlemen, is a political unit, though it is not a state. A set of political units having regular interactions among one another. And he goes on. And he goes on. A set of states or political units having regular interactions, regular enough, sufficiently regular to make the behavior of each a necessary element in the calculation of any other state. I repeat, a, an international system is a set of states or political units, political entities, having regular interactions, having interactions regular enough to make the behavior of each a necessary element in the calculations of any other state. What does that mean? Very concretely, this means that any state before acting on the international scene must consider by anticipation to some extent what any other state might do, how any other state might react to its own first action. This is to ladies and gentlemen, to anarchy, the anarchical society, the term anarchy is in the title. Anarchy prevails on the international scene. This is the starting point of mainstream international relations theories. Anarchy not in the meaning, in the common sense meaning of uh, troubles, disorder, turmoil, and suicide attacks, etc. No, anarchy in the meaning, in the Greek ancient etymological meaning of absence of central government. There is no central authority above the political units, which therefore are, legally speaking, sovereign. The United Nations, of course, is not a central authority above states. So nobody tells the states what to do and what not to do. Nobody punishes states, legally speaking, when one state undertakes what it maybe should not have done. Therefore, states, before acting, must consider what other states might do. And they take into account the prospective action and reaction of other states by looking at the comparative power resources of said other state. It compares its own resources to the resources of any other state likely to react to the first state's behavior. So the study of the international system, therefore, is the study of the power configuration, the power distribution, the distribution of power resources, material power resources, economic and material and, and uh, military resources of the different states. And this permits us to uh, define the structure of an international system. And I ask scholars, but also I ask historians agree in saying that there may be three kinds of structures of the international system. When there are three or more than three major powers, the system's structure is said to be multipolar. When there are two major powers, logically, the structure is bipolar. And when there is only one major power, the system is supposed to be unipolar. So throughout the first part of my class, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I will look at the concrete material structure of the different systems throughout the past 
five centuries, which powers were dominating? When did the domination, the material domination of a power come to an end and why? Which new power emerged? And beyond the mere somehow descriptive dimension, I will try to look at the link between the structure of a system and the peace or stability prone versus conflict prone nature of this structure. That is to say, I will ask the question, were multipolar systems of the past more or less stable? Were bipolar ones more or less? And why is this the case? Is a unipolar system stability prone or not? These are the questions to which I will try to provide answers in chapters two to six. And I agree to say that these six, these uh, five chapters, two to six, are globally, generally inspired, broadly inspired by a realist approach. But the English school is not merely realist. It includes non-realist elements, and these non-realist realist elements are implicitly present in the term anarchical or international society. Once again, Bull provides us a definition, Bull, as well as Bull and Watson in another book, uh, The Expansion of International Society. What is a, an international society? An international society is a set of units who do not merely have regular interactions. When they have regular interactions, they form a system. We saw this. They form more than a mere system. Why? Because beyond the mere regular interaction, they adopt by common consent, by dialogue, they adopt the rules, norms, principles, and institutions in order to regulate peacefully these regular relations. To put it differently, uh, an international society is a group of political units which established by common consent and by dialogue, rules and institutions for their conduct. And most of the time, most of the states concerned do respect these rules, do conform their behavior to the principles, do accept to cooperate within institutions, concretely organizations, international organizations. To put it differently, despite the absence of any central authority above them, states themselves, they are in an anarchical setting, states themselves form a society by establishing these institutions, these rules that most of the time they do respect. And this is the non-realist element, we could call it the Lockean or Groschen element as opposed to the Hobbesian or Machiavellian uh, elements which characterizes the realist approach very concretely in the domain of war and peace nowadays, the United Nations, and more specifically the United Nations Charter, chapter seven, article 51, prescribes how states should or should not behave in the domain of international violence. They should not go to war except to defend themselves, etc., etc. So in the second part, ladies and gentlemen, chapters uh, 7 to 11, I will look at the evolution of these norms throughout the centuries. Not all the principles and not all the norms, there are too many, of course. I will focus on two sets of rules. But these two sets of rules were called by the American scholar uh, Kyle Lascuretz, I hope I pronounced correctly, this sounds like a French-Canadian name, uh, Kyle Lascuretz in his very recent book, Orders of Inc Exclusion, being a realist, he does not use the term international society, but when using the term international order, he's very close to what English school scholars call international society anyway. Lascuretz, 
calls the two types of rules that he's interested in and I'm interested in too, membership rules and behavior rules. Membership rules first, an international society, ladies and gentlemen, is composed, is a set of states. Nowadays, all the states are part of the international society. All the states are part of the UN, which is the institutionalization of nowadays international society. But in the past, this was not the case. So membership rules regard the way states had, or political units, should I say, had population on specific territories, within specific borders, had to organize themselves in order to be acknowledged, you know, to be recognized by the members of the already existing limited international society as likely to become themselves legitimate members. The international society, we'll come back to this, emerged in Europe and it gradually uh, was, uh, it expanded gradually over the whole world. Why were some territories or the populations of some territories or some entities accepted by the then dominating European powers and why not others? The answer to this question can be found in the membership rules. A state must be organized in a given way, must refer to various values rather than to other ones before being accepted uh, as a full member of the international society. And the underlying question, of course, is the following one. Who determines these values? Who determines the legitimate principles that sh states should conform to before being allowed? Uh, to be part of the international society. And the second set is uh, composed by behavior rules. That is to say, once the states are admitted in an international society, which concretely means that they are part of international treaties, they contribute to establish, to sign international treaties. Once this is the case, how should they behave? Which rules do they have to respect, not in their internal domestic organization, but in their behavior on the international scene. And of course, this amounts to asking in our domain, do they have the possibility or not to use violence? What are the conditions of states going to war, if it is possible, and if yes, when and why? So chapters seven to 11 will try to uh, propose answers to this question. So two, separate parts, analytically uh, separated, but substantively linked, I hope so, of course. That is to say, there is an underlying assumption in my analysis, which permits to establish the link between the first and the second part. What then are my theoretical assumptions, which I hope so permits my analysis to be somehow uh, coherent or homogeneous? So in the first part, that is to say, the material distribution of power resources, the material power structure of the international system, my assumption consists in saying that there is in the international system a kind of long-term tendency towards unipolar system, towards unipolar system, systems or structures. To put it differently, the power struggles, which can really consist pretty often in wars, the power struggles among great powers, among major, among major powers, end up regularly in favoring one of these major powers. And this power then will end up dominating the whole system, which therefore has a unipolar structure and no more a bipolar or a multipolar. This assumption does not, in, 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 in positing this assumption, sorry, I do disagree with the English school, or at least with the first generation of the English school. But I'm fairly compatible with the second and the contemporary generation of English school. I'll come back to the main authors in a few minutes. This assumption does not, uh, is not shared either by realist scholars, by the majority, should I say, sorry, by the majority of realist scholars. The majority of realist scholars indeed 
exclude the possibility of any unipolarity. Why? Because they are adherents of the balance of power theory, the balance of power approach. To quote one of them, a classical a realist, historian and practitioner, Henry Kissinger himself, former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor in the Nixon and Ford administration, end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. According to Henry, according to Henry Kissinger in this book, World Order, it's not his best book. This book was published in 2014. It's a kind of short and updated version of his diplomacy, which I consider to be his best book and which goes back to 1994. Anyway, this is what Henry Kissinger wrote in his book, World Order, seven years ago, for more than 1,000 years, so he goes back to past um, centuries and even millennia, for more than 1,000 years, in the mainstream of European statecraft, he looks at theory, order has derived from equilibrium. Order has derived from equilibrium. Big equilibrium means balanced distribution. And it has derived also from, and, and identity, sorry, has uh, resulted from resistance to universal rule, balance and uh, resistance. The European monarchs, the European kings of the past, and we will come back to them in our chapters, of course, were not immune to the glories of conquest. They were eager to conquer other territories. However, and this is the important point in his analysis, they lacked the strength to impose their will upon each other decisively. They lacked the strength to impose their will. No power was powerful enough to impose its will and therefore to dominate the other powers. And therefore the system overall was balanced. So there were at least two major powers and pretty often more than two, three, four, five, more polarity was prevailing. I do disagree with this analysis. I do consider that precisely the power struggle among the different monarchs eager to conquer territories, this power struggle ended up in favoring one of them. One major power ended up being militarily pre prevalent, preeminent, thanks to its economic uh, primacy. And in doing so, I adopt and apply the power cycle theory as opposed to the balance of power. The power cycle theory is shared by a minority of realist scholar. But I would say nowadays more and more as compared to past generations when I was a student, uh, all, all the, the big shot realists uh, were favorable to uh, the balance of power approach. And, Regarding now the second half of Kissinger's quote, identity resulted from resistance to universal rule. There was no universal rule. There was no universally legitimate principle that states had to um, respect when uh, dealing, when behaving, when acting on the international scene. Once again, I do uh, disagree. I think that there is such a universal rule. And where does this universal rule come from? This is the, the assumption at the roots, the bedrock assumption underlying the second part, the analysis put forward in my second part regarding international society. In international societies throughout the century, there are a set of rules that have to be respected by the states, members of this society. There, are, there is a set of rules, principles, values that must be respected. And these rules are diffused, spread, proposed, and sometimes imposed by the materially prevailing power, which declares other values to be illegitimate. Which amounts to saying that just as the international system is hierarchical. The structure is hierarchical. One major power or the other ones, at best secondary or small powers. Just as the material configuration is hierarchical, 
the normative, non-material dimension is hierarchical too. Some values are legitimate. They emanate from the materially prevailing power because the materially prevailing power is also ideologically or normatively preeminent. The rules that states have to respect within the international society, these rules are determined, diffused, and sometimes imposed, including by violent means, by the prevailing, by the material prevailing power. So there is a kind of link, dialectical link between my first and my second part. The international society, ladies and gentlemen, reflects, mirrors, consolidates and reproduces on the long run, the material, materially prevailing international structural international system. There is one that is regularly, there has been regularly four or five centuries now, one major power at least aspiring to become the prevailing one. What's more, the British and the Americans succeeded in doing so. The system does was unipolar, still is nowadays, and to this unipolar structure corresponds what we may call a one-dimensional, a uniform international society characterized by various, a set of various legitimate behavior rules that the states, the other states, had willingly or not to respect. This approach, claiming that the world order in its material and in its normative dimension is hierarchical, is, as far as regards the English school, uh, shared by a member of the younger generation of the English school, Ian Clark, in his book, and also in other books, of course, Legitimacy in the International Society. But it is also shared by uh, realist scholars. So the most important power cycle theorist within the realist approach is Robert Kuppen in his War and Change in World Politics. We have, ladies and gentlemen, critical scholars whose approach I would say is compatible with uh, the analysis that I uh, propose. I am thinking of the Canadian scholar Robert Cox in his production Power and World Order. Liberal scholars, some liberal scholars, state-centric liberal scholars also would, uh, I would say, agree overall with this analysis. John Eikenberry, after victory, where he analyzes how Great Britain in 1815 and the US after 1945 established international institutions, the European Council of Power regarding the British, the United Nations regarding the Americans, in order to consolidate in the long run their military and economic preeminence. And maybe all these authors share the same outlook, globally speaking, because they directly or indirectly are influenced by Edward Carr. The British interwar historian in his 20 years crisis published at the eve of World War II. And if then there is one major book which inspires uh, my, if I may, approach to international relations, I should quote Edward Carr, it's my preferred book in international relations. So, so long for this uh, uh, summary of uh, the different uh, preliminary epistemological uh, remarks uh, regarding my, uh, uh, the way I will proceed, my conceptions, my uh, uh, assumptions. Concretely, let's have a look very quickly at what we will uh, deepen in the next uh, uh, 10 or 11 uh, chapters. Uh, I will share my screen once again. And more specifically, I will show you a uh, uh, chronological table uh, which corresponds to the syllabus that you see now. Here it is. So I will start in 1492 when America was discovered 
regarding the material structure, Spain was dominating, but the system was not, uh, strictly speaking, unipolar. Why? Because of Spain's uh, uh, prevalence, or the Habsburg family's prevalence, first the Spaniards, then the Austrians, was rejected by uh, challengers who refused to submit or to accept to Spain or to accept Spain's preeminence, Portugal at the very beginning, the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean Sea, and beyond, more important in our perspective, the Dutch, the British, or the English actually, and the French. But Spain was powerful enough to spread its values, and its values were Christian values. And to impose these Christian values overseas against the so-called heathen barbarians. Second period, 1648, after the end of uh, uh, the, uh, the Thirty Years' War, uh, the Westphalian treaties were signed. France was the preeminent power, thanks to its victory against the Austrian Habsburgs in the Thirty Years' War. To some extent, Sweden too, the Dutch too, because they got rid definitely of the Spaniards, but France I think undoubtedly, undoubtedly was the prevailing power throughout the first, throughout the second half of the uh, 17th century. England, however, refused to accept this preeminence. So there was a, a kind of bipolar struggle between the two. And in 1713, after Great Britain's victory against the French in the war of the Spanish succession, the British uh, gradually became more powerful than the French, though the French, of course, refused to accept this. So this period from 1648 uh, to 1815 is the period materially uh, characterized by the material preeminence first of Spain, uh, first of France, and then gradually of England. And they, uh, beyond their power political rivalry, shared the same, I would say, a normative outlook of Europe as a European commonwealth. That is to say, Europe forms a commonwealth to be distinguished from the rest of the world. And therefore, the rest of the world can be conquered, not on the basis of Christian values, as was the case with the Spaniards, but on the cases, but on the basis of uh, private property and savages, since they did not knew, since they did not know, sorry, uh, property were legitimately conquered. This was the prevailing conception throughout this century, considered to be the century of enlightenment in Europe. France was definitely defeated, ladies and gentlemen, you know that uh, in 1815, Napoleon lost the battle in Waterloo. So Great Britain undoubtedly became the prevailing power. Russia, Prussia tried to resist, but I go as far as saying that the 19th century was unipolar and hegemonic. That is to say, the unipolarity, the material prevalence of the UK was somehow accepted to be legitimate by the other powers. Therefore, these other powers were secondary by definition. This is the so called Pax Britannica. Great Britain, among Europeans, organized the European concept of powers to try to maintain peace or at least stability, which worked up to the midst of the uh, 19th century. Uh, Great Britain, however, gradually declined. This explains the outbreak of World War I, 1914. Uh, the British managed, together with the French, to get rid of the German challenge. Prussia had unified Germany, you know that. But first and foremost, thanks to the American intervention from 1917 onwards, America, however, you know that uh, stuck to its isolationist tradition, the Senate refused the Versailles Treaty, Wilson's project, and therefore Great Britain went on believing and went on to be perceived as the prevailing power. Therefore, my period goes from 1815 to 1945. And so during this period regarding the non-material dimension, uh, when dealing with uh, overseas, uh, not yet conquered territories, the British and also the French and a bit later the Germans and of course the Dutch, somehow even the Japanese and the Americans he refer to the standard of civilization. We have to civilize non-civilized or semi-civilized entities. This was the so-called white man's burden. <laughs> 
uh, to quote uh, Rudyard Kipling's uh, uh, phrase. After a World War I, ladies and gentlemen, a new opposition uh, emerged. The Western democracies, since they accused autocratic Germany to be at the origin, to be guilty of uh, World War I, of the outbreak of World War I, considered themselves to be peace loving nations. And the autocratic or somehow totalitarian states were stigmatized as brigand states. 1945, a new period. Uh, that I will have a look at, the period of the Cold War. Uh, the United States was the major winner of World War II, uh, tried to organize a new order based on the United Nations. The Soviet Union, however, though participating in the United Nations, refused America's preeminence, so that this was a bipolar rivalry. Basically, the US was prevailing, economically speaking. This explains the end of the Cold War in 1989, when the USSR collapsed. Throughout the Cold War, uh, the Western powers put forward their market democracy uh, as the only legitimate regime. Uh, Western freedom was opposed to Eastern communism or Eastern totalitarianism. And Western market democracy triumphed in 1989 when, for instance, Fukuyama published his End of History. Uh, ever since then, Western powers do consider themselves to form uh, the international community. The international community, ladies and gentlemen, I will come back to this, but I can say it immediately, is not, the term international community is not synonymous with international society. It is the contemporary version of the Western uh, biased perception of the international society as an international community based on uh, democracy, market economy, uh, human rights, Western human rights, etc. etc. So, Western states, what did they do? They did not hesitate to intervene in so called failed states, to intervene militarily against a rogue state, and of course, to fight the war on terror against the global terrorists in the name on behalf of their values. But the United States, though being materially prevailing, despite the system being unipolar, we will see this in chapter six, has to cope gradually with China. China is rising, it is the rising competitor, the rising challenger, the rising contender, and we will see therefore in the conclusion how this uh, rise may impact the existing order you see if you come back to if I come back to uh, the service that I consider to it's a, uh, an attempt to take into account the very recent uh, events I consider uh, the contemporary order to have come to an end one week ago ladies and gentlemen on August 31 when Joe Biden uh, withdrew the very last American soldier in uh, present in Afghanistan. Uh, why? Because he justified this withdrawal by saying America will no longer practice nation building. So it's the end of liberal internationalism. That is to say, it's the end of the doctrine uh, presenting and justifying the Western countries and for the most American tendency to spread its values and to build other nations uh, on uh, the basis of Western uh, uh, values, democratic regimes, etc. And of course, if uh, Joe Biden no longer can afford uh, to fight in Afghanistan or Iraq, etc., it is because of precisely the rise of China as the major threat. Therefore, maybe a new world order is gradually emerging. Uh, for one week now, since if I should find a very concrete turning point, it might be August uh, 31 or August 15 when uh, the Taliban uh, uh, conquered uh, Kabul. Anyway, 2021 will be the last date I do take into account. And 1492, ladies and gentlemen, is the first turning point then that I take into account. So last point in today's class, why do I start in 1492? The reason is the following one, strictly speaking, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 
strictly speaking, there was no international system and therefore no international society before 1492. An international system is a set of political units, independent, having a regular interaction. International society is a set of states having regular interactions, regulated by common principles adopted by the states themselves. No such thing existed before 1492. Why? For the very simple reason, I would say, that empires were prevailing, both in ancient times and in the Middle Ages, in what the Europeans call the Middle Ages. Empires were the privileged form that human societies adopted to organize themselves politically. Egypt, the pharaoh Egypt, Persia was an empire. Alexander the Great created his empire. In China, there was an empire in India too. Rome, of course, was an empire and when it collapsed in the West, it survived in Byzantium. In the Islamic world, the empires first of the Abbasids, then of the Umayyad, then of the Ottomans were empires. In Europe, Charlemagne created his empire in the year 100, uh, 800. In Germany, or what we may consider as the Germanic territories, the Holy Roman Empire of Germanic nation uh, prevailed almost one millennium. In the Western Hemisphere, the Aztec Empire, the Inca Empire, the Maya Empire existed. In Central Asia, the Empire of the Golden Horde, the desert of Central Asia, the Mongol Empire, and even in Africa, the Mario Songhai empires were existing during decades and centuries. The best book on empires and their domestic organization, ladies and gentlemen, this is the French translation, is uh, Jane Burbanks and uh, Richard Cooper's, Frederick Cooper, sorry, Frederick Cooper's empire. These empires, ladies and gentlemen, did not have regular interactions among themselves. What is an empire? What is an empire? An empire is a centralized political system acquired uh, through violence by an entity which controls the effective political authority over the dominated peripheries which were conquered militarily. I repeat, it is a centrally centralized political system composed by a center which militarily gradually conquers territory that will become the peripheries within the empire. And empires of the past were self-sufficient. They organized themselves within their borders and almost had no relations with the outside world, which was considered by the Romans, for instance, as barbaric. So there were no regular interactions with the outside world. The Roman Empire, ladies and gentlemen, for instance, built walls to protect itself and to separate itself and to protect itself from the barbarian world. The Limes along the Rhine River, the Hadrian's Wall in uh, today's um, Great Britain or United Kingdom. In the Balkans, in the Near East, in North Africa. And of course, this was true beyond Rome in China. The Chinese Great Wall symbolizes materially but also symbolically the willingness of the Chinese Empire to have no interaction with the outside world considered to be inferior. So there were no regular interactions among the then political units that happened to be empires and not nation states. There were regular interactions, but they, take, they took place within, and they were absolutely vertical from the core of the empire to the various peripheries of the 
My analysis is not shared by one author, by one scholar, Eric Engmar, in his history of international relations. He considers the Chinese empire, the empire in India, the Aztec empire, etc., as examples of past international systems and to some extent as international societies. You see, right, am I wrong? The question has no definitive answer. I just feel free to say that I prefer to stick to the, I would say, maybe somehow Western centering, I have to admit this, uh, conception according to which before the rise of nation states, there were no, strictly speaking, international system, there was no international society. So these nation states gradually emerged after 1492. The last reason why I chose 1492 is that before 1492, very concrete reasons prevented any regular interactions among political units. And this very down to earth reason is uh, a technological one. The then existing technologies did not permit uh, regular interactions. Marco Polo, I will share my screen again, ladies and gentlemen. Marco Polo, when he went from Venice to China, needed almost three years traveling on land. And when he came back, he sailed along uh, the coast of China, of uh, Vietnam, of India, uh, Persia, etc. What does that mean? This means that the then prevailing technology did not permit the then existing ships to cross oceans, to undertake voyages during the winter season. It was too risky. They would have run the risk of sinking. So only when bigger and more uh, reliable ships were built by a kind of combination of northern techniques, French, Dutch, and English on the one hand, and southern, that is to say, Italian and Spanish techniques on the other, only when these ships were built could oceans be crossed. And what's more, the compass had to be invented in order to permit uh, sailors to know where they uh, were uh, going. And maps, somehow reliable, had to be drawn. Now, such maps did not exist. Ladies and gentlemen, have a look at the map that was prevailing in the midst of the second century of our era, the Ptolemy's map, and compare it now to the prevailing map of 1490, that is to say two years before uh, Christopher Columbus's voyage to Latin America. It's almost the same. You see that there is no Western Hemisphere, there is no Pacific Ocean, there is no Australia, etc., etc. So the then knowledge was limited, which of course prevented any somehow uh, serious and regular interactions among faraway uh, units. Things changed gradually thanks to the evolution of technology and therefore I start with 1492, and this is what I will do very concretely. Next week in 1492, the first uh, part, the first chapter of the first part, I will have a look at the kind of transition period from 1492 to 1648, synonymous with Spain's rise to prevalence and uh, the attempt by Spain to impose its Christian values overseas. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending today's class. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you'll be back next week. Have a great day. Goodbye.